What up, Craig? Craig. Hi, Craig. Hey, Craig. Hello, and welcome back to the paddock. Today, you're joining Rachel, Chelsea, Hannah, Drea, and Ito as they chat all things Ferrari and beyond. Little fun fact, today's episode is a start of the Ferrari triple header. So we're going to kick things off with Rachel about the man himself, Enzo Ferrari. Yes, Enzo Ferrari was born in Modena, Italy in 1898. And during World War I, he had the job of shoeing horses for the Italian army. Once the war had ended, he traveled to Turin and applied to work at what was already one of the most prominent car manufacturers in Europe, Fiat. He was sadly rejected, and this led to a grudge against Fiat that kind of helped develop his ambition to drive. Enzo Ferrari was determined to break into the auto industry, and he started to frequent bars and cafes around Turin where famous race car drivers would seek their entertainment and were known to frequent. This ultimately paid off as he met, and I'm probably not going to pronounce this correctly, but Ugo Savici, who was a test driver for a newer car manufacturer, Costruzioni Meccaniche Nazionalia, <laughs> or CMN. Uh, Civici hired Ferrari as his assistant, and he went on to complete his first race in 1919, uh, he being Ferrari. Ferrari did not remain at CMN for very long, and in 1920, he joined the Alfa Romeo company as a test driver, a racing driver, and a car salesman. In 1929, Enzo Ferrari founded Scuderia Ferrari with the purpose of entering amateur drivers in various races. Ferrari himself, as mentioned, had raced in CMN and Alfa Romeo cars prior to the founding and continued racing with moderate success until the birth of his first son in 1932. The idea for Ferrari came about at a dinner one night in Bologna where Ferrari solicited financial help from three men, textile heirs Agosto and Alfredo Taniato and amateur racer Mario Tadini. Naturally, the next step was forming a team, which ended up consisting of over 40 drivers at its peak. Initially, Ferrari ran Alfa Romeo private cars, most of which were various 8C cars, with most of the drivers being wealthy amateur racers. In 1933, Alfa Romeo actually withdrew its in-house team from racing due to economic difficulties, and Scuderia Ferrari became the acting racing team for Alfa Romeo. Ferrari would remain the sporting director for Alfa Romeo until 1939 after a disagreement with the managing director, uh, Ugo Gobato. Ferrari was actually restricted from racing or designing cars with the Ferrari name for four years after his departure from Alfa Romeo. So after his departure, Ferrari founded Auto Avio Costruzioni and supplied parts to other racing teams. He actually managed to manufacture two cars for the 1940 Milia. And then with the outbreak of World War II, Ferrari's factory was, like many, forced to undertake war production for the Italian fascist government at the time. In 1943, after the factory was bombed by the Allied forces, he ended up moving the operation from Modena to Marinello, where it remains to this day. And in 1947, they would start manufacturing their own cars. Eventually, in order to finance the company's racing endeavors, Ferrari started manufacturing and selling sports cars. The end of the 1960s saw an increase in financial difficulties for Ferrari, and this coupled with the problem of racing in so many categories, having to meet new safety and clean air emissions requirements for their road car production, and development would cause Ferrari to start looking for a business partner. And he actually uh, offered Ford the opportunity to buy the company for 18 million US dollars, which would be about 176 million today in 1963. But he eventually withdrew his offer once he realized that Ford would not agree to grant him independent control of the racing department. This would lead to a decade long rivalry and feud between Ford and Ferrari. And Ford v. Ferrari is a great movie that kind of goes into that more detail. Super, super good. Highly recommend. 
1969, Ferrari ended up selling 50% of his company to the company that he was rejected from, Fiat. Fiat allowed him to remain 100% in control of the racing activities, and they paid a sizable subsidy for use by his Marinello and Modena production plants until his death. Ferrari stepped down as the managing director of the road car division in 1971 following this agreement. Fiat would increase their holding to the, in the company to 90% in 1988. And a little bit of fun fact, the Ferrari logo comes from the symbol that was used on Italian World War I ace Francesco Baracca's fighter plane. This came about after Baracca's parents, who were close acquaintances of Ferrari, suggested he use the symbol as the logo, stating it would bring him good luck. So the beginning of the Ferrari team on the Formula One track itself began with a small delay. You see, their first official participation in the Grand Prix wasn't until the second race of the 1950 series, and it was for the city circuit of Monaco. What had happened was there was some financial disputes, and the team had to withhold entry, so that kept them away from the original opening race, which we know as Silverstone. But... Ferrari hasn't missed a race since Monaco, and they are now the oldest team on the Formula One track. Their first three drivers in 1950 were Ascari, Villoresi, and Summer. Now, Ascari went on to be their first team championship winner, placing first in the 1952 Grand Prix. He also won the 1953 Grand Prix and became the only Italian to win two world championships in F1. In 1954, the FIA changed some rules to the cylinder capacitors, um, which is kind of used in the electric motor systems of the car, where you could be limited to 2.5 liters of naturally aspirated engine gas and to 750 centimeters for those with compressors. So you had two options. You can either choose the first one, 2.5 liters, or the second one, the 750 centimeters of engine capacitors. Since the FIA gave them a choice, Ferrari chose the first option and ultimately got to have a good fight against Mercedes since they chose the same option. The 553 F1 debuted at the Syracuse GP this year as well, which is an alternative to the original 625 model from previous years. The difference is a short stroke engine, rounded bodywork with special air intake, also known as Shark that year. The new bodywork they did did end up popping out because in 1955 and 1956, they were brought more world championships this time by the driver Fangio, with a new chassis construction and an improved engine. I will say the cars still look a little janky to me. Um, these You have to imagine the single riders with the bullet nose in the front and has like a little window screen. It's not very safe. But to them, that was improved and it was good. Fangio did decide to leave the team in 1957, and in 1958, we were finally introduced to the new V6 engines. Now, in this sense, it's very exciting for the team. The car construction was something that they were very into and they wanted to create something new. But the team ended up experiencing two driver losses that season with Musso and Collins passing away. Now, their third driver, Hawthorne, for the Ferrari team did, however, go on to become the first British world champion driving for Ferrari. And he was driving in the Ferrari Dino, which was a car that was named after Enzo's son, who had sadly passed away at the age of 24 due to health issues. And I thought that was a very sweet way to memorize him. Now, 1959 did see the decade close a little grim, with Ferrari being overtaken by Cooper. Now, you don't know Cooper on the grid now, but they were a team that had just created the first car with a rear engine on the Formula One grid. And this car was basically taking out the other teams. We can pinpoint Cooper for being the reason that all Formula One cars now are built with the engine behind the driver. You won't hear about them because they did end up closing their doors around 1969. Following Cooper, many teams on the circuit began constructing new cars and they also started implementing the engine behind the driver in their designs. Ferrari also brought on a new team to the circuit. They brought in Phil Hill, Wolfgang von Treibs, Richie Ginther, Cliff Allison, and Willie Maris. 
I do think it's a little crazy they had five drivers on the circuit that year, but that was allowed back then, so it was interesting. Honestly, the new team was good. In 1961, Phil Hill won the driver championship, and Ferrari finally won their first constructor championship. Phil Hill was also an American driver, so hoorah! Um, just want to get that out there. And we did have American tracks on the schedule. We were in New York that year, so I was thinking about it. That is a wild idea because I can't imagine bringing Formula One to New York now, at least not New York City. That's an idea out there. I don't know if I would want it, though. 1962 was interesting. Basically, the whole team quit. By team, I mean the constructors and management technicians. They all left because there was a worker strike happening in Italy. So the team ended up starting the season with no major updates to the car. It actually really wouldn't be until 1964 that Ferrari saw another driver and construction championship, which was completed by John Surtees, who... Another fun fact is the only man to win the championship on two and four wheel drives. I thought that was really cool seeing MotoGP and Formula One kind of intermix. So John Surtees didn't last long with the team. He ended up leaving in 1966 because he had multiple disagreements with the team manager. So the strikes did cause another delay for the season start of 1967 and the team would continue to face issues. They lost driver Bandini and Monte Carlo and they also received no podiums that season. So they were seeing a few grim years here and there. We did, however, finally get some hope in 1968 with Franco Gozzi. He was Enzo Ferrari's confidant. He was nominated as head of the Scuderia and the press office, and he ended up sticking with the team for decades after. The 1970s were honestly pretty good for Ferrari. Um, In 1974, They had three drivers competing for them in the Constructors' Championship, Jackie Eakes, Ignazio Giunti, and Clay Regazzoni. In fact, Regazzoni, that was his rookie year in Formula One, and he won his first race in Monza with Ferrari. The 1970 season for Ferrari was four wins on the podium and two one-two finishes so that they could clinch the second place in World Constructors' Championship. A fun fact for the 1970 season is that the Drivers' Championship went to Gentsch Rengard, and it was awarded to him after he had died because he died in an accident in qualifying at the Italian Grand Prix. He is the only driver to have won after his death. In 1971, Ferrari placed third in the Constructors' Championship. Mario Andretti won the first race of the season at the South African Grand Prix. So they started out pretty good, and they just couldn't cut it to make it first. But it was looking up compared to previous years. 1972, they only won once that season, and they finished fourth in the Constructors' Championship because they had a lot of engine problems and reliability problems. They went from having three cars on the grid to now wanting to have one car competing for them in 1973, but they ended up using two cars with Jackie Eakes and Arturo Mezzario. They had no wins for the season, but the new model of the car had a chassis, which is the body of the car, that was self-supporting, which was a big thing. Things were starting to look up in 1974 because they had Clay Regazzoni and the common name we now know, Nicky Lauda. They had 10 poles and 3 wins. Ferrari won its 50th Grand Prix when Nicky Lotto won at the Spanish Grand Prix. This was an exciting year that Ferrari competed with McLaren Ford until the last race in Watkins Glen, USA, and Regazzoni and Fittipaldi fighting until the very last second, and Fittipaldi came out first for Drivers' World Championship. 1975, the car was named 312T, And for the rest of the years, they kind of kept the same model and changed up the engines and naming it T3, T4, and T2. The T stood for the transversal gearbox because it was angled at a 90 degree angle to the engine. The car was able to distribute weight better and the engine was more compact. Nicky Lotto won the driver's title with five wins, eight podiums, nine poles, and he got points at 12 out of the 14 races. So consistency is key. 
Fregazzoni also had a hand in helping get Ferrari the constructor's title, and it was the first V12 cylinder to win a championship instead of the V8s that had previously been dominating. Coming right off of that win, 1976, Ferrari came out swinging. They won the first three races, and Nicky Lotta had an accident with two other drivers had to pull him out of a fire during this season, but he only took about 42 days off before he was back in the car racing again. So drivers have a very competitive racing adrenaline heart. Ferrari won the Constructors' Championship, but Lotta was fighting for the title until the end when he retired the car and James Hunt clinched the Drivers' Championship because he finished third, putting him one point ahead of Lauda. Yeah, actually, um, if you guys haven't seen it, the movie Rush documents all of this with like the fire, um, James Hunt versus Nicoletta, like everything. So it's a good one to watch. Plus, it has Chris Hemsworth. It has Chris Hemsworth. Yeah, I couldn't remember which Hemsworth it had. The only thing is Nicky Lauda has said that it's only about 80% correct because I think it was the FIA ended up ruling in the Ferrari's favor against McLaren when it comes to, I think it was Silverstone that year. Um, no, it but was it was the British Grand Prix, but it was at Brands Hatch. But it, was it a took them like two match. months to end up ruling in their favor and ended up having uh, Nikki being the winner of that GP that year. Basically, what happened, for those that don't know, during the race, Hunt won with Lauda in second. But because there was an incident on the race, there was some issue with like Hunt mm-hmm. not completing the first lap because they basically said... In order to restart the race, you have to complete the first lap. But Hunt took a shortcut on the circuit and therefore technically didn't complete the first lap. But during the race, the organizers were like, it's fine. But then Lauda and Ferrari were always like, this is bullshit. So they took it to all the authorities and ultimately got Hunt disqualified, making Lauda the winner. And just one thing to note is that after James Hunt won the Drivers' Championship, he did not end up competing again because he was like, I've made it, we're good, bye. Which was kind of interesting because most people want to continue going and he was just like, I'm good. Yeah, he was a very special character. He sounds very interesting, for sure, whenever I was reading this. So y'all should go check out Rush and this season on F1 TV if you want. In night, talking about Nicky Lauda, he also won in 1977 with two races still left in the season. He had three wins and he got second place six times to be World Drivers' Championship. He also left Ferrari after he officially won and they replaced him with Gilles Villeneuve. Ferrari won its third constructor title in a row with Lauda and Carlos Rutman. 1978 was a weird year because they actually, as you guys, if you haven't figured it out, F1 has not always had Pirelli as its tire supplier. So in 1978, they actually had Michelin as their new tire supplier. And before that, it was Goodyear. And Ferrari got five wins with Rootman and Villeneuve, but they didn't win constructors or drivers. And then to finish out the 1970s, 1979, ground effect that helped generate the downforce of the car for higher corner speed, which ultimately led to driver Jody Schechter getting second place in driver standing and sixth in constructors title. Yeah, and those that don't know, the car has a, you can generate downforce of the car on the way that you do the aerodynamics. So if you have more room, which ultimately ended up helping with carbon fiber later in the years, can help generate more aerodynamic for higher corner speed because you have more air that's able to flow through the car or flow against it versus um, causing constrictions. So the 1980s were a complicated time for the Ferrari team. We had a car that had been winning races a season ago, but suddenly they were nowhere near the quality Ferrari needed to be against these other teams, and they found themselves falling eighth in the championship. 
It was also the beginning of the turbo era for Formula One. So this was an era that Ferrari just really never seemed to get a good grasp on, if I'm being honest. I mean, we had teams like Williams and Renault, and they had the turbo thing down packed. They were placing podiums, they were getting high number wins, and the Ferrari turbo engine was quite literally not up to speed. Now, in 1982, the turbo engine issues, they wouldn't be the only problem for the team. Drivers Villeneuve and Peroni would end up in a silent war after Peroni passed Villeneuve in a race against team orders, only for Villeneuve to pass away two weeks later in a tragic accident that saw his car cartwheeling. And for Petroni to experience a very similar accident at the end of the season, making him retire from a Formula One career. Honestly, Ferrari does not have the best luck sometimes. I will say the history lesson so far just really reminds me how dangerous the sport is. And, you know, thank God for new regulations that keep coming out for the safety and things like halos that I know some listeners will probably say they don't agree with, but I personally think it has saved a few drivers' lives. Now, the mid-80s, it was pretty quiet for the team. Thankfully, there weren't any more tragic accidents. There was a sprinkle of mistakes. They had some mechanical issues because they really didn't get the boosting. And there was no driver championships. By 1986, McLaren, Williams, and Lotus, uh, which is a team that disbanded in 1995 due to financial issues, They were on top of the championship, and Ferrari was just trying to keep up. So, because of this, Ferrari ended up hiring John Bernard in 1986, and this is the man who introduced Carmen Fiber chassis to the Formula One grid with McLaren back in 1981. So, with the new design he was able to create, Ferrari actually found themselves back on the trap with a possible win. And around the end of the season, they ended up finally achieving a 1-2 podium at the 1987 Australian Grand Prix, which at that point was like a god haven gift to them. Sadly, we did end up losing Enzo Ferrari in 1988, and the team just had to power through the season. They were running behind McLaren, but still achieving a few wins and a 1-2 podium at the Italian Grand Prix which I like to think was a race they won in Enzo's honor that season. Finally, to end the 80s, in 1989, we saw a new era in Formula One surface. We are finally saying goodbye to those turbo engines that Ferrari was not good at anyways, and we introduced something that Ferrari actually was pretty good at. It was introducing a new 7-speed gearbox that you can control with buttons as opposed to a gear shift. And Ferrari had actually already tried doing this, like in 1959, with two buttons. But uh, back then, the technology was not up to date, so they did it a lot better this time, and it worked out really well. So the new gearbox, um, it was new technology, of course, so they had a few issues with it during the season, but I expected nothing less considering that. And the 90s weren't that easy on Ferrari either, but Ito will definitely explain it. I mean, honestly, all I can think right now is, when do Ferrari fans get a break? Um, In the early 2000s, but we'll get there. Anyway, the 1990s, they saw Alan Prost leaving McLaren and joining Ferrari, partnering with Mansell. And even though Mansell had been at the team for longer, due to Prost being a defending champion, he was promoted to lead driver, which, of course, if I were Mansell, it would piss me off too. And because of those tensions, things happened like Mansell accusing the team of switching his car with Prost's car at the British GP and other stuff that ultimately caused Mansell to leave the team at the end of the season. But Prost being Prost, during the season, he was a definite title contender after having won five races and only being nine points behind the leading Ayrton Senna before the Japan race at the end of the season. Sadly, on the first lap, there was a collision between the two, which ultimately caused Senna to win the race because he had less damage to the car, and therefore winning the title. In 91, we see Mansell being replaced by Jean Alissi, But sadly, as Chelsea alluded to, 
91 also saw their competitiveness dwindle as their famous V12 engines were no longer competitive against the smaller and lighter and more fuel efficient V10 engines that everyone else was using. This caused Prost to win no races and only get onto the podium a handful of times, much to his annoyance. I mean, he is a championship winner, so why wouldn't he be annoyed? Which he wasn't actually shy about, and that actually got him fired from the team before the end of the season, because he literally said the car was harder to drive than a truck. Do we know a team that has that this season? This whole firing thing gave Gianni Morbidelli a chance to drive in Australia, but they ultimately didn't retain him for the next year. But in 1992, the team continued on their no winning streak, basically, in 1992, 1993, because of issues with their engine and just being slower than everyone else. But then in 1993, Gerhard Berger returned to Ferrari to partner Alisi and Jean Todd, one of the great team principals that Ferrari had, was hired. And with the 1993 car, they were actually able to achieve podiums and pole positions, sadly, no wins still. While 1994 and 1994 Five were marred by poor reliability. Both Berger and Alisi were able to secure a win each at the German GP in 1994 and the Canadian one in 1995, respectively. Also, Alisi came close to winning Nuremberg and Monza in 95. Nevertheless, the car was a solid and competitive upgrade, especially after Berger's victory after having not won a single thing for three seasons. And that started the record of at least one GP victory for the following 20 consecutive season. 96 saw a complete change in Ferrari's lineup with Eddie Irvine and Michael Schumacher replacing both Berger and Lisi. And further, thanks to Schumacher being a former Benetton driver, they also saw a lot of technical team switcheroo because, for example, they got the technical director from Benetton, Ross Braun, the chief designer, Rory Brin, Nicholas Trumbazi, which was head of aerodynamics, and Tad Chapitsky, head of electronics. They all joined Michael at Ferrari. Which makes sense because Michael Schumacher had won 94 and 95 with Benetton. So they were like, where he goes, I go. This was especially good news because Benetton was one of the teams that had the newer V10 engines. Whereas Ferrari was still stuck on the older engines, which made them have all these problems before. But because of the regulation changes in 96, they actually had to adapt to that V10 engine and having a team that already had experience with that engine, it just helped. So at the same time, just because they had this experienced team, not everyone was experienced in with the new engine. So they still had some reliability issues and stuff like that. Um, so Schumacher was only able to score three wins throughout the season, the first one being at the Spanish GP, which because it was Ferrari's first season with the V10 engine, was obviously their first win with a V10 engine. And then Schumacher went on to win both Spa in Belgium and Monza later that season. And fun fact, Monza that season was their first home turf victory in eight years. Thanks to Schumacher's superb performance, despite a still somewhat mediocre car, Ferrari managed to finish second in the Constructors' Championship with Schumacher himself finishing third and Irvine finishing 10th in the driver's standings. 97 saw 
even more reliability for the Scuderia, meaning it was their first chance in the title fight since Schechter in 1979. Schumacher brought home five wins and three other podium finishes. He even led the driver's standing going into the last race by one point ahead of Villeneuve in the Williams. However, a collision between the two cost Schumacher to retire and therefore lose out on the WDC. That collision ultimately cost Schumacher also to be disqualified from the 1997 Drivers' Championship as a whole for unsportsmanlike conduct. Thankfully, however, Ferrari's constructor points remained unaffected by this. So, which is kind of nice, but also weird. So we can definitely see the FIA was already doing FIA things in the 1990s. This meant that they were still able to finish seconds in the constructor standings, thanks to, of course, also Irvine's seventh place finish. After the drama that was the 97 season and some regulation changes in 98, Ferrari came out with an all-new car for that season, like top to bottom. They left nothing the same. Every little screw that could be changed was changed. Schumacher was able to win six races that season, those being Canada, France, and the UK. Those were three back-to-back races, which is pretty impressive. Monza, which was first time since the memorable race after Enzo Ferrari's death in 88 that Ferrari managed a 1-2 at that circuit. However, even those epic race wins didn't hold off Hakkinen at Suzuka, where Schumacher stalled at the start of the race and then suffered a puncture during the race, causing Michael to come in second in the driver's standings with Irvine in fourth. But at least it still gave Ferrari a second place constructor's finish. In 99, the season once again started well for Ferrari, them winning three of the first four races of the season, Irvine scoring his maiden career win at the season opener in Australia, Michael Schumacher scoring back to back victories at San Marino and Monaco. However, the tide quickly turned for the Scuderia because Schumacher had to retire from both the Canadian as well as the British GP. His crash in Silverstone also caused him to miss the next six races due to a broken lower leg, meaning he was replaced by Mika Salo and lost all hope of a driver's world title that year because of this. Hence, Irvine became... Ferrari's main hope in getting a driver's title and he won the next two rounds which was great in Austria and Germany but he was no Schumacher so when Schumacher returned for the final two races of the season people say that he kind of handed Irvine the race leads therefore also caused Irvine to win his first race at the Malaysian Grand Prix both Ferrari drivers being disqualified after that race, though, because of the side deflector panels on both cars being deemed one centimeter too long, making Mika Hakkinen once again the provisional driver's champion. But, of course, Ferrari appealed that decision, and then it got overturned. Irvine then again led the driver's standings over Hockenden by four points going into the final round. But he ultimately fell short of winning the whole thing because he finished third, meaning he lost to Hockenden by two points. Schumacher's second place in Japan helped Ferrari secure the Constructors' Championship, though, which was the first one since 83. Yeah, and in the early 2000s, in 21 years after Jody Schachter brought the Drivers' World title back to Marinello, thanks to the competitiveness of the F1 2000, the single-seater had extremely well-planned aerodynamics. Its weight was much below the minimum 
set by regulations, which helped work on a perfect weight distribution by shifting the ballast and the angle of the cylinders in the engine. This architecture of the new engine ended up setting standards for years to come. Michael Schumacher, supported by a perfect team, ended up winning the season's longest battle against Hakkinen with McLaren and the German driver gained the title in Suzuka. For the Ferrari team, this was the start of one of the most successful cycles in history of Formula One. In 2001, the Ferrari confirmed itself as the team to be beaten with Michael Schumacher. This year, Michelin Tire joined Bridgestone in F1 as the official tire supplier. At the Hungary GP, at the 13th race out of 17 total that year, Schumacher was able to conquer the driver's title, which ended up being fourth in his career. Barrichello proceeded to win the Constructors' World title. And fun fact, the F2001 car was actually nicknamed the Anteater due to the shape of its nose. In 2002, Ferrari dominated with 15 victories in 17 races, 11 were by Michael Schumacher alone, and confirmed the Drivers' Championship yet again, and the Constructors was by his teammate Rubens Barrichello. Record year thanks to the extraordinary F2002 car domination for Ferrari, they started working on obtaining smaller aerodynamic sides and titanium fusion gearbox and then a new engine with a lower center of gravity that ultimately helped them with tighter corners and etc. In 2003, several modifications regarding the regulations came along this year. After quality, the cars ended up having to sit in Park Fermi and if you don't know what that is, it's closed off zone controlled only by FIA with limited access to the teams prior to race start. After the session gets set on the grid, the German driver set a new record and equaled the one with five world titles of Juan Manuel Fangio, thus turning into the most successful driver in the history of Formula One. Thanks to the F2003, GA were the initials where in homage of Gianni and Ginelli, who had died in January 2003, so bless his soul, the Ferrari gains the fifth constructor's title in a row. In 2004, a record season for Ferrari made, do, made history due to the F2004 car, which exceeded expectations in terms of performance and reliability. Also, regarding the challenges set by regulations that were coming out by FAA left and right, Schumacher gained the fifth world title and a 1-2 Ferrari yet again in the Constructors' Championship. Now, in 2005, the year was quite rough for Ferrari. The car remained below the expectations, ultimately what they wanted, and ended up placing third in the Constructors' Championship. This year, the regulations caught restrictions on the aerodynamics of the car and stating you had to use the same tires, for the span of the entire GP. Therefore, pit stops were only for refill of fuel, which is not the case now, year to date. In 2006, this ultimately ended up being the end of Schumacher's era, and unfortunately, and V8 engines have arrived along with the restrictions that were lifted on the tire changes during the race. That didn't last long. Schumacher announced his retirement with 72 races, won, and 58 pole positions. He won five drivers and six Ferrari Constructors titles, and still to this day, proceeds to be a legend. In 2007 was the year of new drivers and a fight for the world title up until the last race. This consisted of Hamilton, Alonso, Massa, and Rockman three rookies, and Ferrari obtained 12 fastest laps that year. In 2008, though, the elimination of traction control and gearbox lifespan regulations were introduced. At the end of an intense season, like the previous one, Ferrari won the 16th Constructors title with eight victories total that year. 
Now, the revolution of F1 2009. This ultimately brought new technical regulations were released this season with completely different looking cars. Single seaters with a different front wing and back wing change, aerodynamic changes, diffuser location changes, introduction of the key ERs, which is kinetic energy recovery system, was brought into place. Each driver could use up to eight engines throughout the season now. Tests throughout the year were no longer allowed, so if you made any changes to the car, you were not able to test it. These were the main modifications and regulations of the season and ultimately led to the way we format the car to the state. Unfortunately, Ferrari only had one success and placed fourth in the Constructors' Championship that year. Yeah, and now on to the 2010s. In 2010, Kimi Raikkonen's contract was supposed to go until the end of the 2010 season, but he was actually replaced with Fernando Alonso prior to the start of the 2010 season, continuing Ferrari's history of signing tried and true talent over less experienced ones. Announcing that, the Massa and Alonso duo would remain unchanged until at least 2012. It looked like Ferrari made the right decision by signing Alonso as he and Massa started off strong, bringing home a 1-2 finish in Bahrain. However, from race 2 on in Australia, that promising start was a thing of the past. As during first seven races of the season, they dropped from first third in standings of the constructors due to a series of low point finishes by both drivers. The German GP thankfully saw another 1-2 finish for the Scuderia, even if it was a controversial one due to rumors of team orders being enforced during it, which had been banned in the sport since 2003 due to a incident in 2002 at the Austrian GP where Rubens Barrichello was ordered by Ferrari. Ferrari, what's wrong with your team orders? So he was ordered to give the lead of the race to Schumacher in order for Schumacher to win and then have a better shot at the championship. Granted, team orders had been part of the sport pre-2002, but this incident, especially receiving so much negative press, was literally the straw that broke the camel's back. Because this team order was given very close to the end of the race, and both drivers were very unhappy with that team order, and to the point where Schumacher actually refused to, even though he won the race, he refused to take the top step of the podium and wanted Rubens Barrichello to take it. And his refusal didn't actually stop there, but it continued on to the press conference where he refused to take the center seat, which is usually reserved for the first place finisher. All these shenanigans by Schumacher led to Ferrari actually being punished because of breach of podium procedure. In terms of the ban, while the ban was like a complete ban on team orders, oftentimes teams would get around that by saying, hey, driver behind you is a bit slower than you. Code for slow down, let him pass. And such an example was that incident in 2010 with Massa and Alonso, where Massa's race engineer said, and I quote, Fernando is faster than you. Can you confirm you understand that message? And Massa, being Massa, promptly slowed down, letting Alonso pass. And that action ultimately caused the FIA to fine Ferrari $100,000 maximum possible fine at that time and the incident was then further brought to the FIA council but weirdly enough nothing came of it so after all of that Alonso went on to win Monza Singapore and the main race in Korea 
helping Ferrari retain their third place in the Constructors' Championship and helping him come in second behind Vettel in the driver's standings. 2011 wasn't a great year for Ferrari. It was a year where they made more waves off the track than on the track, with things like being sued by Ford for the use of the name F150F for their car, and the fear, basically Ford saying, we're gonna sue you, actually made them change the name of their car from the English way of saying 150th to the Italian way of saying it with just an O. And that then made Ford settle with them in Detroit. 2011 also saw Alonso renew his contract early until 2016 and Massa opted for another year as well. Hence why in 2012, we once again saw the same duo in Ferrari Red, just like in 2010 and 2011. Alonso once again narrowly missed out on the driver's title, the Red Bull of Vettel just being way too strong. Is it anyone having deja vu on that? 2013 was the final year of the 2.4 liter V8 engine configuration, which was introduced in 2006. And it really didn't see any surprises. It was the third year in a row where Alonso lost out to Vettel and Ferrari once again finished third behind Red Bull and Mercedes. As I mentioned before, 2014 saw new regulations and rule changes as well as the replacement of Massa with Raikkonen. However, not even the new rules or the rejoining of Kimi could really help the struggling Scuderia. They only achieved two podiums, yet somehow managed to finish fourth in the constructor standings, despite the first winless season since 93. Those struggles ultimately led to a few shakeups throughout the season, Stefano Domenicale being replaced by Marco Matacci as team principal and Luca Cordero di Montezalo announcing his resignation as Ferrari chairman ahead of the race in Monza. Alonso also left the team at the end of that season, being actually replaced by Vettel, who then partnered Kimi from 2015 through 2018. And lastly, Ferrari updated their simulator software, basically going with other teams' simulator setup. This overhaul of Ferrari, basically, continued into the 2015 season with Sergio Marchione stepping into the role of president and Mauricio Arrivabene replacing Matachi after only one season. All these changes seemingly had a beneficial effect on the Scuderia as Vettel managed to make it onto the podium in Australia. Malaysia saw even more improvements as Vettel was able to end the team's 34 no-win streak by holding off both Mercedes drivers. And he then went on to win twice more in his maiden season at the Hungara Ring and in Singapore. These wins and a few high point finishes meant that Vettel and Raikkonen were able to finish third and fourth behind the very dominant Mercedes of Hamilton and Rosberg. However, just because they had a good 2015, sadly didn't mean they had a good 2016. They scored no wins. However, their 225th win came in 2017 at the opening race in Australia, where Vettel started leading the Drivers' Championship, causing a Ferrari driver to lead the Drivers' Championship for the first time since Japan 2012, over a thousand days earlier, giving everyone a sliver of hope that Mercedes' dominance was coming to an end, as it was also the first time that a non-Mercedes driver led the driver's standings since Vettel himself with Red Bull at the end of 2013. Spoiler alert, that didn't last long. Mercedes came back with a vengeance in China, causing Vettel to finish second behind Hamilton, 
while Weddle was able to hang on to his lead over Hamilton in Bahrain by winning the race, it was Raikkonen that gave them the edge over Mercedes in the Constructors' Championship by three points. Monaco saw Ferrari dominate once again with Vettel being the first Ferrari driver to win in Monaco since Schumacher in 2001. It also saw the first 1-2 since 2010 and Kenemy's first pole since 2008. Sadly, the luck they had in Monaco didn't translate onto the streets of Baku where an incident with Hamilton saw Vettel being awarded a 10-second stop-and-go penalty. A stop-and-go penalty means that a driver has to drive into the pits, stay stationary for whatever time they were assigned, drive back out, that's it. No changes to the car, nothing. Like, no tire changes, nothing. However, due to Hamilton also being given a penalty for the incident, Vettel still managed to extend his lead over Hamilton in the driver's standing, even though he didn't win. The race was such a mess at that point that Vettel was summoned for a special meeting with the FIA after the race. However, they ultimately decided to not take any further actions as Vettel apologized for the incident. Vettel once again managed to pull off a win in Hungary and Raikkonen completed their second 1-2 of the season. Sadly, even that 1-2 didn't prevent Vettel from losing his lead in the driver's standing a couple of races later on Ferrari's home turf in Monza, no less. While it looked like Hamilton's lead was short-lived, the crash of two Ferrari driver with the Red Bull of Max Verstappen in Singapore meant that Hamilton was actually able to extend his lead even further. Malaysia saw Vettel start last on the grid due to an engine issue suffered in FP3, and Kimi wasn't able to start at all due to an engine issue as well. While Vettel was able to pick apart the field during the race, he ultimately would end up shy of the podium, and it just went even more downhill from there, honestly. Japan saw Vettel retire due to a spark plug issue, but at least Vettel was able to pull off one last victory in that season at the last race in Brazil, even though driver and constructor championships were already a done deal by that point. In 2018, both Vettel and Raikkonen decided to stay with the prancing horse, even though they didn't manage to make many waves that season. Weddell once again finished second in the driver's standing, with Raikkonen third. Thankfully, that 2-3 finish also meant that they became second in the Constructors' Championship. Even with his decent third place in the driver's standing, Ferrari ultimately decided to not retain Kimi Raikkonen for the 29th season, but rather decided to sign 2018 rookie Charles Leclerc. This move at the time was seen as rather controversial as Ferrari isn't known to sign inexperienced drivers. I mean, look at Vettel, look at um, Schumacher, look at Alonso. They all had WDCs under their belt before they joined Ferrari. And Leclerc was the second youngest driver they ever signed. This signing, of course, meant that Raikkonen was without a seat for the 2019 season, but he would eventually actually take Leclerc's open seat at Sauber, which was now called Alfa Romeo, where he would stay until his retirement in 2021. Further, Ferrari announced that Mattia Bonotto would be taking over as team principal in 2019. In 2019, Leclerc actually managed to get his first pole position for the Scuderia in Spa, ultimately winning that race, which made him the first Monegasque driver ever to win a GP. Monza once again saw Charles on pole and heroically defending against the Mercedes of Hamilton Bottas to go on to win Monza, which was the first time since 2010 that a Ferrari driver won at Monza. A couple of weeks later, Vettel managed a win at Singapore, just ahead of Leclerc, which meant a 1-2 for the Scuderia. 
the first since Hungary 2017. This win by Weddle also um, was the last win for for the team until barring 2022, but Hannah will talk more on that later. In 2020, it was Vettel's last year with the team. And on the other hand, Leclerc signed a new five-year contract with the team, which is actually the longest contract in Guderia Ferrari history, which at the time, everyone was like, why are they doing this? Not even Michael Schumacher got a deal like this. What are they thinking? But at the same time, he had a fantastic 2019 season, so why not? But due to COVID, um, the calendar was reshuffled so much that Ferrari actually participated in their 1,000th Grand Prix at the one-off Tuscan GP in Sagarperia e San Piero Tuscany. But other than that special fact... 2020 wasn't really a good year, as they only managed to finish fifth in the driver standing, their fir- their worst finish since um, the 80s. Yeah, and in in 2021, they were able to actually secure the third constructors championship, which ended up being a big relief on the team. Signs managed fifth, and Leclerc manage seventh with the strongest driver lineup on the grid besides Red Bull. I don't know if y'all know, but Ferrari had a disastrous 2020, but thankfully 2021 was much better and beating their competitor McLaren um, for the top three in the Constructors' Championship, they were neck and neck that year. Also, Carlos' first year with Ferrari ended up being a success and they ultimately had a competitive car again which was a high for ferrari in 2022 they kept the same momentum ferrari had a great year with charles actually obtaining second in the driver's championship he won in bahrain but i'm not sure if that's the curse working which is why he won second the f175 car was not only a good looking car to the eye it was a good racing car able to compete against the red bulls and the mercedes which were the dominant teams to date but the car did struggle with some reliability issues strategy and overall some driver errors compared to the progress red bulls were able to make that year mattia benito the team principal also ended up stepping down now to date while ferrari has had some ups and downs At the beginning of the season so far, we are hopeful that there is significant progress throughout the year going forward. Charles has had two DNFs and Carlos has had quite a bit of struggle with the FIA on penalties. Many gearbox changes and upgrades are not working how they attended, but I still remain hopeful and what could be remaining of the year ahead and will we see upgrades in Emola? Now, just a little bit look into the future. And while the future is always unknown in F1 going forward, there have been many repetitive talks about introducing new power units coming in 2026. Actually, side note, the deal has already been signed from 2026 to 2030 to try this out. With the energy recovery systems going to be increasing to the new power units of 350 kilowatts compared to the already 120 kilowatts. This is basically just energy transferring into the engine barrel. The MGUH uses exhaust energy, that is the heat energy remaining in the exhaust gas acts as a function of its temperature expanding at a mass flow rate to spin the turbines during the energy recovery phase, converting the energy into exhaust gases, causing the car to excel forward. Electrical energy. Also, something to note with Carlos and Charles' contract up in 2024, will we see another multi-year contract come into play? Or will we have a change slash new orders given going forward? One thing Ferrari noted as something they want for the future ahead is Ferrari would like to come up with a car that is not only aggressive to the eye, but also appealing to the eye without overturning technical regulations. So 
we'll see what's to come. And today we're going to do a driver quote, which seemed only fitting to do a Vettel quote. And that quote is, as I'm sure everyone is expecting, everyone's a Ferrari fan. Even if they say they aren't, they are Ferrari fans. And with that, I'm going to say thank you to all the Ferrari fans listening today, because as Vettel says, everyone's a Ferrari fan. Be sure to become fans of us on all of our socials, which are Paddock Girls Podcast on everywhere except for Twitter. She's Paddock Girls Pod. So be sure to check us out there and share it with all your friends, your family, your dogs, Instagrams, everything. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you at the next race. And Mola, here we come. Bye, Craig. Bye, Craig. Bye, Craig. See you, Craig. Bye, Craig.